schools and then um, and then as I came here um, and got started uh, you know we had the pandemic so uh, this year has been uh, such a uh, just a relief uh, being able to do things and that we need to do to meet kids needs and just everything's so much more um, what we need and um, so it, it's it's been a great year so far. Oh, great. Well, if you don't mind, Melissa, I'm going to give about one more minute, if that's okay with you, Wallace, to see if anybody comes in and and then we'll get started. If it's just the three of us, we'll work it like it's, like it's a room, like um, Todd Wicker said, of a thousand people. So we'll, we'll so have I, fun. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, so I was looking at uh, Liz Irwin is, is the, the group I was trying to get into. Is that, are you presenting for her? No, I'm I'm doing um, Wallace. If I'm, if I'm in the correct place, I'm doing uh, creating a growth mindset culture for your school. Um, this see, should be break out. I, I don't eight. know if I'm looking at the wrong thing, but I don't see you on like any of these. Right. Which I'm all for that too. Um, <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm good anywhere. I just want to make sure that I am looking at the right uh, program and. Um, yeah, so I will um, I will share this uh, document with you. Um, actually, I, I may be able to link it here in the chat. Um, but it's it's a Google Doc here, and uh, if you don't mind to spell that name for me, I'll search here for you as well. Uh, Liz L I Z Irwin E R W I N. Okay. Yeah, I don't actually see that here on, I don't see Liz Irwin uh, listed on uh, the document that I'm using. So, uh, so that's, take a, that's, interesting, yeah. I, I don't you, know what I'm looking at then. Um, um, if you, uh, let's see, did that send through in the meeting chat? Maybe not. Let's try again. There let's see go. if I can share my phone. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Melissa, can you see can I can you see what I just shared? Yeah, so this is totally different than the one I'm looking at. I don't know where I got the one I'm looking at. Um, that's kind of crazy. Um, I, I wonder. It's got Todd Whitaker on there. Let me see. There's a, at eleven twenty, Lisa Oaks. And twelve o'clock, Lou Young. So, okay. So, well, I have the right one now. So, I'll I'll discard the one I was looking at. I, I'm glad I asked because I would have been I would have been confused all day. Um, maybe that was last year's or something. I don't know. I don't know how I pulled that up. Um, but okay. So I'm I'm ready to roll. I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm good now. Okay. Well, I'll get started and we'll just have, like I said, we'll have a personal chat. And as people join, we'll, we'll love to have them here. But what I'm going to work with today is how to develop a growth mindset culture in your school or your district or where you may be working. And the quote I love starting with a lot of times with when I do my presentations is, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And the reason I love that is... <clears throat> I'm the greatest advocate there is for public education. Um, my mom was one of 11 kids. Um, I have over 40 some cousins just on my mom's side. I'm the first person ever in my, on my family has ever gone and finished college. Because of public education, because of people like yourself, Melissa, I was able to do things I would never been able to do unless I, because of public education. You know, I see it were put down quite a bit that people sometimes want to put down public education. But because of that, we're the great equalizer. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how we can make the culture in your school, in your district, a mindset that that your teachers, your students, your administrators, your custodians, anyone that works with you are perseverant and self-reliant. Because if we have perseverant and self-reliant people in our schools, I don't worry about 
as a principal of Scott County High School, I rarely ever talked about test scores. Um, what I talked about is did we work to our potential? And that's the biggest thing I think we need to worry about as educators. Are my teachers working potential? Are my students working potential? Am I working potential? Are my custodians? If we work to our potential, that's all we can do. And that's, what's, that's what my focus was as an educator. So what I'm going to do, if you give me a second, I am going to share my screen. Um, and I guess you all can see that. Thank you. Is that correct? Yep. All right. And I think the single most important thing that you have to be able to do as an educator is, hold on, so I'm going to move a few things around so I can see that is make sure that you're taking care of yourself. John Maxwell says the single biggest way to impact an organization is to focus on leadership development. And what we'll talk about at the end of this session is, are you paying attention to yourself or are you putting all your emphasis on your profession? A lot of times as a principal myself, I remember one night I counted 114 nights I stayed after for school for something. What I forgot to do was take care of myself. And as administrators, I think we have to do that. We have to take care of ourselves. Part of taking care of yourself is continuing to focus on your own development as an educator. We make sure that our struggling teachers are, are, are getting somewhere. We make sure our good teachers, we make sure that we have the right schedule. We make sure of all the little things to run a school properly. But sometimes we forget the, the, the focus on ourselves. What we have to do from time to time, and that's what you're doing today, is focusing on yourself. Um, there's almost no limit to the potential organization that recruits good people, raises them as leaders, and continues to develop them. So I'm proud of you guys. I'm proud of everybody at this session today because you're taking time to do that. Um, what my targets will be today is, one, is to understand the difference between a fixed and growth mindset. There may be nothing there if you want. Yeah. Um, somebody's I hear it in the background. Um, <laughs> number two is leadership methods to assist educators with different skill levels and mindsets. Uh, number three is the growth mindset inventory within your school to help you to start developing a mindset in your school. And if we can, we'll try to develop a plan to create incremental change in your school culture. Just a little bit about myself real quick. Um, Wallace said this a minute ago, but I was a history teacher for 12 years. And quite honestly, that's what I still am. I'm a retired educator, um, but I still read every night. I read history. I listen to podcasts. That's my passion. For eight years, I assisted principal and principal Scott Kenny High School. And one thing I always work with leaders is this, is sometimes you're in the exact right place you're supposed to be. When I was principal of Scott County High School, I was probably the happiest I was in my professional career. But sometimes in our mind, we think we should be going to the next step, the next level. Um, the, the superintendent asked me to be his director of secondary because we were doing some really cool things at the high school. And we had seven or eight schools at secondary. He wanted me to help lead. I said, no way. I love being principal of high school. Fast forward to May of 2000 seven um, I went to it was getting state after school for FFA banquet I was exhausted I'd been to 114 events that year I was tired I called that superintendent said can I you still got that position he said absolutely it's the only decision in education I regretted I left the building sometimes you're at the best place you could possibly be for seven years I was director of secondary schools in Scott County didn't hate it just did not love it like I did being principal so sometimes part of being a leader is figuring out where your best position is. My best position was being principal of high school. Um, I've been retired now since 2014 and for the last seven or eight years, I've conducted professional development all over the state and the number of states around the country. And I love doing this. A um, couple of pictures there. Uh, top left-hand picture is my, me giving my diploma, giving me my son's diploma. Um, as director of secondary, I was able to do that. The bottom picture is my youngest son, Lucas, um, gave him his diploma. 
the picture, the young lady on the right is my wife. The way we met is we team taught American Studies at Scott County Schools. Uh, we were just randomly kind of put together, and we ended up getting married and got married down in Millsboro, Kentucky. And she's one of the greatest teachers I ever worked with. In the top right, pretty much everything that's important in my life. It's my two daughter-in-laws, my two sons, my two dogs, and my wife. I, I did say my wife last. I guess I shouldn't have done that. But that's that's my life now. I love what I'm doing. I'm blessed to be doing what I, I'm doing. Um, the reason I took a second to do that, a lot of times as principals, your teachers have no idea how hard it was to get to where you are right now. All the work, all the all the sacrifices that you made, all the mistakes you made, everything you've learned from. If you want to build strong relationships with your teacher and to be able to do a growth mindset culture in your school, you have to have strong relationships. You have to have good rapport. First thing I think you have to be is, is honest with your teachers. If your teachers are not meeting a standard and you're trying to make them feel good by saying they are meeting a standard, you're not helping that teacher. But think of anybody that you really respect and listen to. Those are the people who you have respect and rapport with. If, if you take that time to build that respect and rapport, your teachers will listen to that. Encourage, and I heard Todd Whitaker say this, what you encourage teachers to take chances even if they fail. Unless they're willing to fail, they're not willing to grow. The biggest part of, part of growth is to, is to step out of your comfort zone. Either in life, you're going to be comfortable <clears throat> or you're going to be growing. You got to make a choice. Today, I'm not very good at Zoom. Keith asked me to do this. I said, I'd do it. I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable to do this, but today I will grow because of this. Teachers must be willing to make mistakes. If you're not allowed, if, if you want them all to be perfect all the time, you will have a mediocre culture in your in your school allow them to make mistakes one of the best examples i had and this is one of our elementary schools in scott county one of our teachers has this out in the hall when you take risk you learn that there'll be times when you succeed and there'll be times when you fail and both are equally important and the cool thing that this teacher does is every week she puts out on this board there's a little clip with every kid's name on there she puts out there on that board something that they've made they want to write down something that they were successful in and something they struggled in and they clip it on that little clip and every week that teacher goes down that hall and works with every kid and talks about the what they've done successfully but what she really focuses on their struggle and she praises that struggle because if these kids are wanting to grow they have to push themselves to a struggle but the coolest thing that teacher does is the very first clip, the very first square up there is for her. She writes something she's successful in and something she struggles in. Because what that teacher knows, if kids know that she's willing to struggle, they're more willing to struggle. If kids think if that teacher is perfect, then that kid, if they don't get it right the first time, they quit before they get to the struggle. If, if your teachers know that you also struggle, they're more willing to struggle. If they think you're perfect, they're going to try something once. It doesn't work. I'm not. I'm going back to my comfort zone. Let them know about times that you have struggled. Let them know about times that you, it was hard for you. If you're working with a new teacher and they're trying a new technique, talk to them. Say, I, I remember when I tried X technique. It wasn't successful at first, but here are things I did. Here are things, books I read. This is how I became more successful. Let them know about your struggles and let them know how you fought through that struggle because that's where true strength comes from. Um, the next thing I'm going to show, and if you go, and Melissa, I don't think you have this chart, but um, I'll put it up for you. If you go to the main thing, it's right here where it says mindset diagram. Um, this is the main thing that we're going to work from is this diagram here. Melissa, can you see that? Okay. Yeah, I can. I actually have it because okay. I have the new form now, so I'm good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, well, Carol Dweck, who wrote um, Growth Mindset, 
or mindset said there's five so there's two mindsets there's a fixed mindset and a growth mindset fixed mindset people believe either you have the ability to do something or you don't either you have the ability to draw to be an artist or you don't either you have the ability to play music or you don't either you have the ability to do math or to learn math or you don't and probably the greatest thing i always give an example is if you've ever been in a parent teacher conference and all those teachers are around and that teacher sits down and you have the math science english social studies health pe teacher all sitting there and mom comes in with junior and mom will look at that math teacher and says no wonder you can't do math nobody in my family can do math that is the ultimate fixed mindset what that parent just told junior is no matter how hard you tried you're not going to be able to do well in math. She basically told Junior that there's a math gene and you ain't got it. That's a fixed mindset. Growth mindset, people believe, you may not be the best math teacher in that, in that class, but if you work at it, if you put the time in it, you can do almost anything you want to, but you have to be able to work at it. Carol Dweck said there's five things to look at to determine if somebody's a growth or fixed mindset. The first thing is how they deal with challenges. Fixed mindset people, once they hit a comfort zone, want to stay in that comfort zone. They do not want to try anything more difficult. At Scott County High School, we would have kids in freshman English make all A's, sophomore English make all A's. We say, why don't you take advanced placement English 3? Now, put me in the class where I'm going to make sure I make an A. Also, is you also have teacher, you, this will be with teachers. Teachers will have taught the same lesson plan for 12 years. You'll say, let's try this new technique. Now, I'm comfortable the way I'm doing it. I'm going to stay in this in my comfort zone. Either you're going to be comfortable or you're going to grow. Growth mindset teachers, growth mindset students are always looking for a new challenge. They're willing to take a challenge. They're willing to try something new. They're willing to put themselves out and be uncomfortable. Fixed mindset people do not want that. Once you get to the challenge, the next step, Carol Dweck says, is how you deal with the obstacles. Because even if you take a challenge, if you're going to try a new teaching technique, you're going to, you're going to hit obstacles. You're going to have kids that are going to fight against it. You're going to have parents, if you're a week behind, calling you. Even if that young lady, take, we finally talked her into taking the advanced placement English 3, she may take the challenge. She takes her first test two or three weeks into school. She makes a C on it, first C she ever makes. What that student often does is she's hit her first obstacle. So she will go to our guidance counselor and say, put me back into regular English. I've taken that challenge. I wasn't successful at it. I hit an obstacle, put me back to where I'm comfortable. Growth mindset people understand that any challenge you take, you're going to hit an obstacle. Once you fight through that obstacle, you will become stronger. If you want to be stronger mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, you have to fight through a challenge. As educators, um, we have to be able to understand that everything we do is not going to be successful at first. You're going to have kids. When I talk to parents, and I do this with parent groups all the time, I ask a parent, how old is it to when you finally give up on a kid teaching them how to walk? And they look at me like I'm crazy. All kids learn to walk at different ages. Some kids learn to walk at 10, 11 months. Some kids learn to walk at 15, 16 months. The kid who learned to walk at 10, 11 months does not have more value to our society than the kid who learned to walk at 15 months. We keep on working with that kid and fight through that obstacle. The third thing Carol Dweck talks about is effort. Fixed mindset people believe it's not cool to work hard at something. Either you're given the gift, even you're given the talent to do something well, or you weren't. If you try hard, it doesn't look well. good. Some of the worst things we've done for some of our students, and don't leave this conference thinking that this old guy told us gift and talent is bad, but sometimes the worst thing we do for kids is letting them know that they're gifted and talented. It puts a mindset into it. If they have to work it hard at something, it shows that they're truly not gifted and talented. Where 
what Carol Dweck says is the most important part of this whole diagram is the effort part. Are you willing to work hard? Growth mindset people understand to be great at something, you have to work. I use examples when I work with students, with teachers, some of the greatest athletes in the world. Steph Curry is one of the greatest basketball players in the country. He had one Division I scholarship offer from Davidson. Steph Curry, after practice, practices by himself for hours. He has made he has talent, but he has made himself one of the greatest basketball players because he works hard. The greatest musicians in the world do this. The greatest artists, they have a little bit of talent, but they put the work in. Great people, great athletes, great musicians put the work in. The fourth thing is criticism. Fixed mindset people, and I guarantee you, you work with this with your teachers. <clears throat> Think about when you do evaluations with your teachers. The fixed mindset teachers, if you tell them that, you know, they need to work on X, Y, and Z, they will make every excuse why they are not doing well. They're not coachable. They don't, they don't listen to criticism. The important part of criticism is having a good respect and rapport with them. Going back to what I said originally, if you have respect and rapport, they're more willing to listen to you. Fixed mindset people don't want to listen to it. When I did an evaluation, I still remember a teacher I did one of my last few years as principal. I gave him a very poor evaluation. The four or five things he told me, well, the kids don't like me. You don't like me. I don't have the materials. I don't have X, Y, and Z. He, that then became my challenge. That teacher, but I would have to start working with him. And while I work with him, I fight through, through obstacles. I'd have to give him extra effort. That's how this chart works. <clears throat> Growth mindset people, my theory is none of us like to be criticized. If if your evaluator tells you 15 things you've done well and one thing you need to work on, the thing you hear is the one thing you need to work on. Growth mindset people, if you criticize them, then they will say, tell me how I can get better. Give me the, give me the methods. Give me the way. Give me the route to get better. Growth mindset people may not like to be criticized, but they take criticism and they learn from it. <clears throat> The fifth thing is success of others. Fixed mindset people want to be a big fish in a small pond. They do not want to work against greater competition. I heard Todd Whitaker say earlier that if he wants to get better at tennis, he plays people that are better in tennis than he is. If you want to be the best chess player in the world, you cannot play eight-year-olds in chess every day. You'll feel good because you'll probably win, but you will not get better. Fixed mindset people want to feel good about how – they want to stroke their ego. Growth mindset will push themselves against greater competition. I will never be able to do what Todd Whitaker just did. He is much more polished, much better than what I am, but I'm willing to get in here and do a, a session right after him. Listening to him made me better this morning. I've got to push myself against greater competition to get better what I am. I'm going to have one more, and this is mine. The last one I think that that you have to add to this chart is process. Fixed mindset people want instant gratification. We live in an instant gratification society. I'm gonna ask a question to the group and I don't know how many are in here right now, but um, if, <clears throat> if you'll put this answer in chat, if you're on vacation, and you go to Google and you write places to eat near me and it starts to spin, how many seconds will you give it until you click off onto something else? How long do you give it? So if you'll just put that answer in the chart, how long do you give it? Okay, I see five to 10, Wallace three, Tammy five or 15. <clears throat> Think about that. This right here, if you can't see, I'm holding my cell phone up, has more technology, more memory, more computing capacity than put the man on the moon in 1969. What you hold in your pocket has more compute. For those that are my age, you probably think back to when you had AOL and it would take two to three minutes just to connect. Then if you wanted to download the picture, it would take a minute and a half to two minutes to download the picture. 
Now, if you cannot get something in five to 10 seconds, three seconds, 15 seconds, you click off onto something else. We live in an instant gratification society. If you cannot learn it quickly, then there's no value to yourself. You quit. Growth mindset people understand delayed gratification. It takes time. It takes the process. To be a great teacher, it takes mistakes. It takes going through things and, and trying it again to get better at something. Fixed mindset people want to be able to be great at something automatically. They do not let the process take place. That's not the kid's fault. We have put them, we have created a culture of instant gratification. <clears throat> if any of you all have ever done a research project and had to use the card catalog or whatever it had to be and go through that process, you understand delayed gratification. Kids today, if they can't get a piece of information in seconds, then they don't think they can get that information. They don't understand how it is to work for something. Teachers are some of the same way. You have a large group of millennial teachers now. They don't know a different world. They want instant gratification. Help them understand to be great at anything. Help them understand that when you became a principal, it was a process, that you went through the process to get better also. So this chart right here is what we're going to use interactively through the rest of the what we're going to deal with today. So we'll come back to that in a minute. One of my favorite quotes, and this is a quote that actually I was given to my second year I was teaching. Uh, a young man gave me this quote from, from Frederick Dus Douglass because he, he knew I struggled my first year teaching. Matter of fact, what I often tell a lot of new teachers is I have 150 some odd kids that I need to apologize to. They were the first 150 kids I taught. All of us go through that struggle. All of us do. And what Frederick Douglass said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops that plow on up the ground. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Just think about that. If you want to be better at anything, you have to go through some type of struggle. If you want to be stronger, you have to get in the weight room and you have to struggle. If you want to be better at math, you have to work harder problems, fight the struggle, fight through the process and get better at it. Growth mindset people understand that quote. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. That's where we can help teachers understand. Struggle is part of the process. It's okay to struggle. Do not embrace well, the best thing we can tell teachers is to embrace that struggle. That's how we're going to get stronger as educators. All right, this is what I want to do. And let's see, let's go back to my participants here real quick. If you don't mind, if you are on, if I can maybe see a picture of you so we can see who's here, because this is going to help me. Um, go back. This chart is going to help, help us understand and apply growth and fixed mindset to our schools and to our teachers. I use this chart both with my teachers and both with, with building leaders. And what you have here is four squares. And you may have seen something similar, but the way I use it is with growth and fixed mindset. The top left square says growth mindset, high skill. These are teachers that have a growth mindset and a high skill set in what they do. These teachers are incredibly valuable to your school. The top right one says fixed mindset, high skill. These are teachers that have a, they are great teachers, but they have a fixed mindset. They're very good at what they do, but they're not willing to take new challenges. They're not willing to fight through obstacles. They're not willing to work hard at new things. They don't take criticism well, and they're intimidated by the success of others. The bottom left is who we're going to work with today. These are teachers that have a growth mindset and a low skill level. These teachers want to be good. They desire to be good but their skill level just isn't there yet. These teachers are incredibly valuable to us. And they're not necessarily your first, second year teachers. I had some teachers that taught for me for eight, nine, 10 years and still were growth mindset, low skill. They just struggled with teaching methods, but they had a growth mindset. The bottom right column is a teacher that has a fixed mindset and a low skill level. 
What I will tell you this, we used to be part of it, invitational education in, in Scott County. And part of inv invitational education, we looked at procedures, we looked at policies, we looked at facilities, we looked at all these different things to make our school more invitational. But what I really believe, all those other things only made up about 5 to 10% of what made up our good school. The most important part of your school are the people you hire. If you have a large block in that fixed low skill, you're going to struggle. Um, it doesn't matter how pretty your school is. It doesn't matter what your policies are, your procedures are. If you do not have a large, if you have a large group in that bottom right, you're going to struggle. And what I work with school systems is how to get those teachers out of that mindset. But also I work with teaching methods to make them more successful. I combine both of those in my in my sessions. But what we're going to work with is the bottom left. We're going to work with a teacher that's a growth mindset and a low skill level. And this is what I want you to do. And I'm going to go back, if I can go back, to this chart. And I want you to look at this chart because I want you to use the right side of this chart to help you answer this question. What I want you to do, and I'll give you about a minute and a half to do this, is I want you to just describe what that teacher's like to be in your school. The teacher that has a growth mindset and a low skill level. What's that teacher like? And you can use words in that right-hand side to help describe that. So take a minute and read that to help you understand what that teacher's like. Then what we're gonna do after we describe that teacher, we're going to say, all right, how do we best help that teacher? So take a minute and a half, look through there, and just in the comments, describe that teacher. What's that teacher like? If you just joined us, all we're doing is working on this chart. All we're doing is describing a, a student that is a growth mindset and a, I'm sorry, a teacher who is a growth mindset and a low skill level. If you'll just kind of put in, in, into the comments, some descriptors of that teacher, uh, we're going to give you about 30 more seconds to a minute more just to write a few descriptors. What's that teacher like to have in your school? Tammy, thanks for your addition to that. Let's see what else we got. Rob, thank you. Give us maybe a couple more on that so we can work off of these.
All right, Tammy, I'm going to give you a heads up here in just a second. I want you to unmute and kind of talk to me about what you meant by they make it easy to learn, desire education outcomes, and willing to learn. So if you take a second and think about that, I'm going to ask a couple others. Now, one thing I work with teachers is the one of the first things I work when I work with teachers is questioning techniques. And one thing I ask teachers is to never allow kids to do unless you ask them is to raise their hand. And the reason I say that is because what we tend to do is if we ask a question and a kid raises their hand, we call on that student first. And then what begins to happen is students who finally figure out, well, if I don't have to raise my hand, I don't have to work. What I want every teacher to do with their kids is to make that kid with the expectation that they may be called on at any point and they have to work. But another thing I teach teachers is this, is if what kids are think pair sharing, you're not pair sharing now, but you are kind of putting quite answers down, go around and find kids that don't answer as often and help them be successful. Call on one of those kids first. That kid has worked for you. That kid has got a good answer. They've answered a question correctly for you. Now they're going to be successful in your class. If you only call on the kids with a question with their hands up, you will start developing a fixed mindset about questioning in your class. I go through about 10 to 12 negative questioning techniques, 10 to 12 positive questioning techniques on how to create a growth mindset in your classroom just by the way you question students. I do that with with assessment, I do that way, the way you set your classroom up, everything that, that any kind of method we work with kids, they can learn to that. So Tammy, do you have your mute off? I do. All right. Talk to me. What's that teacher like that has a growth mindset and a low skill level? Um, so they are approachable for sure. Um, and, you know, happy to discuss strengths and weaknesses usually can I you know usually do identify their weaknesses and you know make it easy to guide them from there and they're willing to learn they're willing to um, discuss and and try something different so if you look at what Tammy said um, if you can go almost straight down that chart is that teachers willing to take new challenges they will listen to criticism they may not like it but they will listen to it they're willing to put the work in um, they're not really concerned that if one teacher is better than them and the, and, and, and the success of others. But the most important thing is that teacher is willing to go through the process to get better. Um, Melissa, tell me kind of what you thought. So um, I have a couple of, I have, I have a lot of new teachers uh, and young teachers um, in, in our building and um, so I have several that, I, that that come to mind when I start thinking about this, and I have several that fit into this category because they're so excited about everything, and uh, their their attitude is just you know willing to work, willing to get in there and uh, do whatever it takes to 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 get where they need to be. Um, but the one thing I've noticed with them when when I do meet with them to to you know for a coaching visit or uh, you know talk about what's going on in their classroom, they've already self reflected, and and that they've already identified a lot of the things that. Um, you know, that are going on before we even have that conversation. They, they, they take an initiative to do that. And, um, and they, you know, they're really good at, I, this wasn't good. And so, but sometimes I find that they're really hard on themselves. Um, and, you know, so sometimes they take it to another level and you're like, oh, hold up, you know, <laughs> you've got great things going on. Um, you know, don't beat yourself up. Now let's move forward. And how do we, you know, how do we get there? But they, they're open to ideas. They're open to anything that, uh, that comes their way, they're willing to step in and, and help. Um, and, and other coworkers kind of gravitate to them. Uh, and then they, you know, they look or they look to them for um, advice and help and, you know, to hang in there together. So um, they're great people to have around, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and what I really want to focus on, what Melissa just said, is the greatest anxiety we can have is when we're asked to do a skill that we're not prepared to do. And a lot of these teachers are coming in with a lot of a lot of energy, a great mindset. They just do not have the skill level now. And when we work with those teachers, we really have to focus it down on what skill levels they need to get better. 
and how to get there. And that's what I want to do now. So if we describe that teacher just the way you did, the next step I want to do, and I want this to be because there's much more experience listening right now than it's talking. And I want to have your all's input before I put some things up there. So if that teacher is that way, if they have a lot of energy, they're willing to learn, they listen to criticism, they're willing to work, um, they're willing to take on new challenges, they're willing to go through the process, then what's the best way to lead this teacher? How do we help this teacher the most? Because what I'm trying to show you, and we're not going to do all four of these squares, we're just going to focus on this bottom left. But even as we ask teachers to differentiate instruction, we also need to kind of differentiate leadership with our student, with our teachers. So what I'd like you to do is just take a minute or two. If that teacher's that way, what's the best way to lead them? And what I'd like you to do is put that in the comment box. What are some of the things? And we're going to discuss it as a group. So take a minute and a half or so and just write down some of the things, the best way to lead that teacher. If you're joining us, all we're doing is working on the bottom left of this quadrant. Um, what we're focusing on is the best way to work with a teacher, uh, how to lead a teacher that has a growth mindset, a low skill level. Um, participants are typing in in the chat box ways to help and lead that teacher. And we'll discuss those when we get a few of those in there. Matt, I love your answer. I'm going to start with yours here in just a minute. So if you'll just take a second to think through things you may want to add to that. All right, Matt, where are you from? Where's your what's your district? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me, uh, for me, county schools. All right. Talk to me about what you what 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 are you elementary, middle, high? What what's your what's your position? I'm at a primary school at Barry Hunt Primary as assistant principal. Okay. So tell me about your answer. Well, how do we best help these teachers? So we uh we have a, a couple of different cadres we have for our new teachers. We have once a district wide that the teachers go to. We also have a small group at our school for our first uh, one and two year teachers. 
So we work with them and trying to learn their strengths and things of that nature so that they can, you know, build those up there so they can start sharing those with other teachers, getting comfortable putting themselves out there. Uh, and I think it also shows, you know, young and old teachers alike that they are capable of learning, they're capable of leading, and I think it pushes everybody along. You know, what you're, what you're saying is that one of the, a couple of things I love out of that. One is when I work with groups of teachers, teachers are at a point that they're afraid to say something because they're afraid to be wrong. If you let people build relationships with each other, like you say, put them in small groups or groups of that, they're willing to make answers after they feel comfortable in that. But they got to be able to be put into that. And that's going to help that teacher because I remember as a first year teacher, I was afraid to ask things because I thought I would be stupid. Um, building that comfort level by putting them with a group to someone they can build a relationship and trust is going to have a lot of success to that teacher. And the other thing Matt said is if we do not support these teachers, I went to uh, University of Kentucky with a principal from Scott County High School to look at finding possibly new um, teachers for this high school. University of Kentucky, the mothership of, of colleges in, in Kentucky only had, I think, six or seven math teachers at secondary level that they were going to put into the workforce. We have to support these new teachers. We have to give them support so they be successful because we're losing teachers left and right. And what Matt is saying, I think is the most important thing we do is help this teacher because all we have to help this teacher with is their skill level. They have the right mindset. We have to help them with the skill level. Melissa, tell me about your answer, please. So um, I just think, you know, guiding them by asking them questions. If we give them all the answers, then it kind of goes back to what you just said, that they feel like they don't know and they're not going to know that, you know, we have to let them discover and let them make those mistakes so that they can see what, um, you know, where they are, what they need to do and, 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 kind of feel their way through what works and what doesn't. Um, uh, we learn through, as we said earlier, we learn through our struggles. So I think um, I think it's important for us to let them do that and allow that safe space for that to happen. And what you, a couple of things you said, when I work with teachers, the first thing I, one of the first things I'll ask them, what are we doing for students they could be doing for themselves and why are we doing it? Because if you keep doing it, they're going to keep letting you do it. You're going to have to let that teacher go through some struggle, go through some failures, go through the challenges, but the most important thing Melissa said is do it in a safe atmosphere, that it's okay to do that. If the teacher thinks that they may be fired, <laughs> now if they do something terrible, yeah, but if the teacher makes simple mistakes and their fear that they may be fired, then they'll never take a challenge that will lead them to mistake. They will stay at a level of mediocrity. If we challenge them to make to make mistakes, to get better, to get stronger, the same way we expect kids, you'll create a growth mindset culture there. All right, so what I'm going to show you next is a couple of things. And I just um, I just reread, and I need to move stuff around so I can see it. Um, if you've never read Simon Sinek, um, I highly recommend it. But at the very end of um, Leaders Eat Last, if you go to the appendix of it, he will talk about how to help millennials who are struggling. And a large percent of your teachers that are in a growth mindset, fixed skill level or low skill level are millennials. And you all almost went through exactly what he said, mentor and support them. You got to give them support. Matt talked about that. Lead by example. Give them other people that are doing it well. Let them come into their classroom. If they are not starting their classroom off well, find a teacher in your school that knows how to do the first five minutes of school or five first five minutes of class and help that teacher. Talk to them about your failures. Talk to them times that it wasn't easy for me either, that I also struggled as a teacher. That will make them more comfortable to struggle also. If you told them, all oh, this was easy for me the first time, then they, they're going to think they're not worthy of being an educator. Give them the opportunity to fail. Give them opportunities to develop human skills. That's some of what the millennials are, are struggling with. They have been, been raised in a Facebook social media society. A lot of these do not understand how to call a parent. I heard Todd 
uh, Whitaker talking about how the first call a parent. When I was first assistant principal, I hated calling parents. And the reason I hated calling parents, because this is how I would start the conversation. Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, your son is killing us at this high school. He's in trouble all the time, this, that, and the other. That parent would come right back to me, and we'd start an argument. The head principal said, well, let me listen to how you do this. And he heard me say this, and he said, stop. He said, let me make the next call. He called the parent, and he said, Mr. Jones, this is the principal of Scott County High School. We want to make our kid, we want to help make your kids successful. Will you help us? As soon as that parent said yes, then he started having the conversation. It's the way we deal with human beings. And some of these teachers do not know how to develop human skills. Take a chance on them. Let them make, make mistakes, support them when they <coughs> make mistakes and take a chance. But also realize that they're the leaders of tomorrow, but you're the leaders of today. You have to be able to show examples of what good leadership looks like because believe it or not, yeah, I still remember when I was a first, second, third year teacher and thought I would never want to be a principal. I was a teacher for 12 years, never thought I'd ever want to be a principal. But eventually these teachers you're working with now are going to be the future leaders. The other chart I want to show you is something I show when I show teachers. As I do this exercise with teachers, as I've gone through the state, I've collected a number of things that the teacher said of how to best help kids. The first thing that they talk about <laughs> is praise their effort. If a teacher works hard, praise it that they worked hard. If a kid works hard, praise it that they work hard. Scaffold instruction. Don't put too much on that teacher at once. Don't try, here's six methods we want you to get better at. Have one method they get better at. What I heard one of you all say is find areas of high skill. Find what they're good at. Be patient with them. They want to be good. Just be patient with them. You have to show that you understand delay gratification with them. Possibly pair them with a growth high skill. If you have a teacher in your classroom or in your school that's doing things well, say triage what you want them to get better at. I want them to get better at how they start class first. Let's work on that. Then once they get better at that, then let's work on a new skill. Understand that there's positive mistakes. Praise incremental growth. What we tend to only want to do is praise it when we meet the goals. The goal is important. The standard is important. But if they make small steps to that, praise that. Give them a safe environment. That's exactly what Melissa said. Give them a safe environment to fail, to take challenges. Build relationships. And just the same way with kids, give them wait time. What Melissa said is let them discover where they want to get better at. That discussion, I think, works a lot better than if you come in here and say, here's five things you need to get better at. If you let them self-reflect, give them time to think about it, and then let them lead that discussion, most of the time they will come up with the exact same things that you came up with. You just have to give them time to do that. Wallace, how much time do, are we looking at? As of right now, we're looking at having around 14 minutes left. All right. I believe that. Let me just double check here to be sure that I'm right on that. Okay. Uh, the times are uh, staggered, I guess. So, yeah, uh, we finish at 1030. Okay. All right. Well, this is the last thing we're going to do. Um, so there's one activity you can take back with your leadership to kind of work with teachers. I do this when I do administrative trainings. I do this when I do teacher trainings. It's the exact same format. And I let teachers know when I do that quadrant that when I work with administrators, we put teachers in the quadrants. And I let them kind of figure out what quadrant they're in. Um, and that self-reflection sometimes is very important uh, for that teacher. Some of them are very honest. They realize that they're a fixed high school teacher and how to help that teacher. The other thing I want to talk about real briefly, and we just have a few minutes on this, is how you can use this idea, a fixed and growth mindset, to change the culture of your school. If you go back, let me go back to it real quickly. Um, if you go back to the, to the chart that you were given, um, how to select um, where you want to go, 
If you clicked on where it says administrative mindset chart, you will pull one up that has about eight or nine on here, but we're just going to look at the first three. So what I work with administrators is, what are you already doing well that creates a growth mindset? So if you look at the first three that's on there, one is staff meetings. How do you run a staff meeting that develops a growth mindset? The second is how do you hire that creates a growth mindset? And the third one is evaluations. How do you use evaluations to develop a growth mindset? So this is what I want you to do. Very similar to what we did a minute ago is all I want you to do is pick one of these three, either staff meeting, hiring, or evaluation. And in the chat box, put one thing down that you're already doing well at your school to create a growth mindset. So make sure you understand the instructions. Now, when I work with teachers, I have teachers, I teach teachers to have kids repeat those instructions. Um, because what I expect is every kid was listening to me but if that kid cannot repeat that instruction, I call on another kid, they repeat that instruction, then I go to the original kid. What I really work with teachers is, is the expectation that when you're teaching that every kid's working, to have that expectation. So take a minute and just either under staff meeting, hiring, or evaluation, what's one thing you're already doing well to create a growth mindset in your class, in your school? So take a minute and we'll come back and talk about it in about one minute. And the importance of this is, again, there's much more experience of people listening than the person that's talking right now. If you're willing to put something up and share, other people from this group are going to be able to read this and take ideas, and then they can put that into the, um, the right-hand column of things they may try to get to develop a growth mindset in their school. So give about 30 more seconds if you don't mind to put a response in there. And then we'll talk about a couple of those response and then we're going to finish up. Melissa, thanks for yours. Tammy, thanks for yours. Tammy, I love your answer. I'm going to call on you about five seconds. So if you'll think through what you want to say, give you a little heads up first. And I think that's important to do when you go around and tell students they're going to call them first. Give them time to think about it. Um, so Tammy, tell me about your staff meetings. Um, so we have switched from, you know, every Wednesday staff meetings to um, we are a leader in me school. So we have different action teams and everybody has, you know, their own action team and they meet um, monthly to discuss, you know, upcoming things and, you know, ways to move forward as a school. And then the leader of each action team, we meet once a month with, with um, the leader and me coordinator, which is our guidance counselor, but also me. And we, you know, discuss what the progress of each group and, you know, ways that we can help move them along as well. So, um, so that's been, that's been a huge way to promote shared leadership this year. Excellent. Um, 
did you have some teachers that kind of fought against that, that, that did not want to do this effort, that they were more comfortable just coming in and sitting and listening, or was this been successful right from the first? Um, I think it's been pretty successful. You know, you have a few that can't always make the meetings or, or whatever, it, you know, maybe we have a lot of stuff going on after school as well, but I think, you know, 90% are there and are excited because, you know, they're, they're the ones moving forward. So a lot of times when I get a question, I just say, there's an action team for that. So, <laughs> and um, I'm able to, you know, move that over to them and and let them discuss and, you know, but we always come back together and then we have staff meetings when needed um, if there's something outside of what we're doing in those areas. But for the most part, that's what kind of guides our school. And what I love about that is that when you pull your groups together, it's for growth and educational and the teachers to get better. I was just like you because there's times that you need to have a 15 minute staff meeting because you need to understand that we're going to have fire alarm or or we're going yes. to, this is how we need to do testing. And they just need to sit and get. Yeah. But if all your staff meetings are sit and get, then you mm -hmm. start to lose them. No, those What's are the, only as ahead. needed. Sorry, those are only as needed. Yep. Yeah. And they'll appreciate that. Teachers mm -hmm. appreciate that. Melissa, tell me about one of yours that you wrote about. Um, okay. So um, in staff meetings, we try every staff meeting to have um, an opportunity for teachers that, um, you know, that have gone out to other trainings um, and, and they to bring things back. But I, I always tell them, you know, look at what was most beneficial for you. Look at what was going on in your classroom that this has helped you with. Because if you're struggling with that, somebody else is probably struggling with it too. So how can you share that um, that with them? And I, and I don't know that I've really put a, uh, to talk about how we can get better, I, I don't know that I've really used the whole growth mindset aspect when I tell them that. Like, I, you know, it's just a conversation we have, but maybe I need to be more intentional and say, you know, as we're all learning and we're all growing, you know, it's, it's it'd be great for you to share your struggles with with everybody else. So, so to put more of an intentional focus on the struggle and, and how that training helped them with their struggle, I think that may be um, a way we can improve. So. Excellent. And, and I think when I work with teachers, one of the biggest aha teachers to figure out exactly what Melissa says is, one, how can I incorporate growth and fixed mindset and what I'm already doing or, or two, they kind of figure out where they are in this growth or mindset continuum. Think about using that with your building leaders. I also have one for teachers on the way, you know, they set their classroom up, the way they do questioning, the way they do assessment, the way they do evaluation, everything like that. I have a, a one for that that I work with teachers, but it's important to teachers and educational leaders evaluate what they're already doing and give yourself credit for what you're doing well don't really don't have to always have to be putting yourself down if you're doing something well celebrate it but also find an area of growth you don't have to find an area of growth for all of these but if you find one or two areas of growth work on those and that's the biggest thing i work with teachers if you have if you leave this session and say here's 12 things i'm going to work on you're not going to work on any of them Leave this session with one thing, maximum two, that I'm going to get better at. And that's what we're going to focus on. All right. To finish up, um, we'll skip a couple of slides. I was going to talk about James Clear. If you've never read Atomic uh, Habits, I highly recommend it. Because if you want to change any, if you want to reach a goal, you can set all the goals you want to. But if you're not willing to change your habits, you're not going to reach that goal. It's a wonderful book on how to change habits. Um, I'm not going to have time to get to that. Um, I will tell you um, the thing that helped me most as a principal. I remember one time um, we went through a, a session at Scott County Schools to kind of find out what your purpose was. And I'm a very much a to-do per, do list person. Every day on my to-do list, I wrote curriculum, instruction, skills, and motivation every day. I still have these to-do lists in the box. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a yellow pad person. As I did my to-do list, I would look at that to-do list and say, okay, which of these to-do worked on these four things? If they worked on those four things, I gave them precedent. If they didn't, I eventually got to them. But you as a building leader have just so much energy. If you work on the things that don't lead you to your focus, you're going to run out of energy. 
I also have this, and I highly recommend this as you, as a human being outside of educational leadership, work on your own goals. Work on your own things that you can be at. I still have five sets of goals. I call them my four S, family, faith, fitness, and financial, and intellectual. Every day, every week, I try to work on something on one of these five things to get better. I'm an old retired man, but I still try to get better. Okay, to finish up, I do want to take just about one minute to make a shameless plug. I don't work for anybody. When I retired, I'd worked for somebody since I was 12 years old. I worked on a farm. I worked, you know, I worked at jobs. I worked as an educator. I worked for myself. My website has all the information that if you're interested in me working with your teachers or your administrative teams, you can go to my website, southworkgrowth.com. You can email me. I have a Twitter. Uh, there's my phone number. But what I do, I don't do many student groups anymore because what I try to do is have teachers to be able to take what I do with students because students, a one hour session with me students doesn't go very far. What I need to do is get teachers with the capacity to work with students. If I work with parent groups, I work with teachers and I work with administrators. So if you're interested in working with me or me working with your school or your district, send me an email. There it is. But to kind of finish up, if you all have, I think we got about a minute or two. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, please ask me and I will I will finish up and answer. Them. Well, I'll, I'll just say I wasn't um, obviously I was a little confused about the, the whole schedule for today and um, having the wrong schedule. But I, I'm glad that I ended up in this session. It's been wonderful. Um, and I think you've, um, you've done a great job. Um, and so I appreciate you. And I'm just glad that I ended up here. Well, if you know others that, because I'm going to do this again at 120, just let them know. I'd love to have, I will work as just as hard with four or five people as I work with 40. But I'd love to have a large group in the afternoon. Um, you all. And again, going back to the first thing I say, make sure you're all working on yourself as educational leaders. You work so hard helping everybody else. Make sure you focus on yourself a little bit. Take that time. It's important. Thank you. Anybody else questions or comments? Um, I'll just say that I'm glad we were able to help you uh, figure out your schedule, Melissa. And uh, hopefully we'll see you around later today. Uh, next, uh, everyone will head back to the main room, I believe, for... Um, a conversation with John Akers about school safety. So, uh, uh, and, and again, this room will open up uh, again at uh, 1120 uh, for more presentations. So keep an eye out on the schedule and hopefully we'll uh, see y'all later today. And I'll, if it's okay, well, so I'll stick around in this chat room if anybody wants to talk to me okay. for a few minutes, but yeah. I'll probably stay for the next 10 minutes. If not, I'll okay. go and fix me some lunch. And I will say too, uh, Chip, just to, to help you out here, if you need, and, and later today too, uh, there are uh, breakout rooms in addition to these. Um, trying to see here the number of those so that I see here. Uh, they should be listed on the schedule. I'm not seeing them on mine, but there are additional breakout rooms so that, you know, if you wanted to carry on a conversation after a session ends, you're uh, able to do that. So. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Yes.